day across the years, and it was really a lot to say about this day, and it must be something that was pretty important, you know, to the disciples, because this event made it to all four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, all will record this. So if you have your Bibles or your notes, would you open them with me to Luke chapter 19, verses 37 through 40. And I kind of want to get a sense of what was happening on that day. It's the Passover uh, celebration going on in Jerusalem. And Jesus came down the Mount of Olives and then into the city. And uh, I'm presuming that he went in through the Eastern Gate. And, uh, uh, you know, it's a fascinating thing that I was able to go to Israel a few years back. And I wanted to bring you a picture of that. Uh, that's a very beautiful, beautiful setting uh, to praise Jesus in. And so imagine coming down the Mount of Olives, this big hill that's got all these olive trees. And when they get to the bottom, they put Jesus gets on this donkey and the people begin to celebrate and worship him. And by the way, from the Mount of Olives, you can look up across on the Temple Mount. And at that time, you could have seen the temple of that day. Uh, so there was a lot of people worshiping and praising. Let me read it to you. Luke 19 and verse 37. It says this. Then as he was now drawing near the descent of the Mount of Olives. By the way, that's right where that picture was taken. The whole multitude of the disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works that they had seen. Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And some of the Pharisees called to him from the crowd and said, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. But he answered and said to them, I tell you that if these here should keep silent, the stones would immediately cry out. That day, Jesus is declared to be the king by his disciples. Those who loved him, those who saw his miracles, he is declared to be the one who comes in the name of the Lord. And the whole entire multitude is praising him. Now, they may not have fully recognized him as the Messiah, but certainly they recognize this one as the miracle worker. Come on. It says they praised him and rejoiced because of all of the mighty works that they had seen. Now, I'll tell you, the religious crowd didn't like them praising Jesus like that. And so they told Jesus, uh, you know, hey, you better rebuke your disciples. They're making too much noise. And on that day, Jesus said, look, if they don't praise me, the rocks are going to cry out. And I wonder today if 2,000 years later, if in this house of the Lord, we still don't have some of those kind of people that are going to praise God and are going to worship God, sometimes even in a loud voice. Come on. Am I talking to the right crew today? Amen. How many of you say, I'm not going to let a rock take my place? A stone isn't going to take my place on uh, this Palm Sunday. In fact, on every single Sunday, I'm going to be in the house of the Lord. And I'm going to praise Him. I'm going to worship Him. Because guess what? I've seen the mighty works He's done. I've seen the miracles. I've seen the lives that have been changed. And so, if you're one of those sincere disciples who love to praise the Lord, just give, make a little noise in the house today. Come on. Amen. Now, for many years, I have really enjoyed that aspect of the story. But what I have realized as I meditated and researched this event this week is that not only was this a triumphant day for Jesus, but the entire event was also a training ground for his disciples. Do I have any disciples of Jesus here today? If this was a training ground for the disciples. And so, well, today we're going to give him high praise as we celebrate the Lord's Supper in just a little while. We're also going to take a look at some of the lessons that the disciples must have learned on that particular day. And so I want to talk today on the subject, choose a donkey over a horse. Apparently Steve did, right? Now, <laughs> That's the cutest little donkey, I think, out at his place. And 
Hallettsville. He calls him Eeyore. He's kind of short and stubby and cute. But when I think of a donkey, I don't necessarily think of Steve's donkey because I have to think of the hundreds, possibly thousands of donkeys that I have seen in Latin America, Cartagena, Colombia, that were hard at work hauling things all over that city when I was a missionary. Now, I don't believe in reincarnation. If you do, you need to understand you're believing in a false teaching and a false something that's a big, huge deceit. There's no such thing as reincarnation. But if I did believe in it, which I don't, but if I did, I would not want to come back as a donkey. Come on. Uh, they're not too handsome. They're kind of cute, but they've got to work really hard. But I'm going to tell you this. Jesus chose a donkey, all right? And what is interesting is that Jesus got his disciples involved in this whole process. Okay, so let me read to you what happened out of the book of Matthew, chapter 21, verses 1 through 3. This is, now when they drew near Jerusalem and came to Bethphage at the Mount of Olives, then Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go into the village opposite you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Loose them and bring them to me. And if anyone says anything to you, you shall say, The Lord has need of them, and immediately he will send them. And I want to give you some lessons today that the disciples learned as they went about this and as they experienced uh, what happened during that triumphal entry in the days that follow. And, and I believe that these lessons, they just weren't meant for Peter, James, John, and Bartholomew. Come on. They were meant for you and me as well. Okay, so here is lesson number one, and that is this. We must serve with humility. we got to serve with humility. Sometimes I think it must have been hard to have been a disciple of Jesus. Now, it was glorious, don't misunderstand me, but it was hard. How many of you thought, think Jesus demanded some things of his disciples? I mean, those disciples had an inside relationship with Jesus. That means that he was their mentor, their spiritual advisor, their boss, their king, their lord. He was their rabbi, right? He told them what to do, and they did it. They would not question what he said. And some of the moments that they had following Jesus is, the orders must have been incredibly glorious. In fact, the Gospels tell us that he gave them power over, uh, you know, to uh, over unclean spirits and to, and to heal in, in his name. Come on. Matthew chapter 10 and verse 1 tells us this. It says, and when he had called his 12 disciples to him, he gave them power over unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal all kinds of sickness and all kinds of disease. Now, we know that they were sent out, right? They were sent out with the 70. And so this group of disciples, they understood what it felt like to cast out a demon. Come on. They knew what it was to believe for healing and to see the lepers cleansed and the blind eyes open. And, and I'm sure that some of the people probably even recognized them as Jesus' disciples. You remember Peter, don't you? He tried to hide out in the crowd. Remember that? He's just following afar off on the night that Jesus was betrayed. And he thought, I'm just going to sneak in here and see what happened. But because he was one of the disciples, even the little girl said, ah, oh, he's one of them over there. He had to actually curse and deny Christ, you know, in order to, you know, to, so that he wouldn't be seen. But they were known by the crowd. And, and so these guys had walked in the power of, of God. They had seen the miraculous. And so it must have been kind of prestigious, right, to be one of Jesus' disciples. Uh, and they had maybe even become just a little bit famous, right? And and so it's kind of hard to go from one being one of the main actors on the stage to being a stagehand behind the curtain. And it must have been a little bit confusing when Jesus said, to two of his disciples, go ahead of me and, and go get a donkey and, and bring it back to me. Now, that seemed like kind of an unimportant job, right? But humility is demanding, okay? Sure, I'll go work miracles in your name, but man, I, I, I don't really think I want to be on donkey duty. <laughs> All right? Heal the sick, that's fine, you know? 
I cast out a demon, I'm ready. Come on. But I don't really want to be on donkey duty. I mean, can you imagine if I got up here one Sunday and said, ladies and gentlemen, I really need somebody that is willing to serve the Lord, and we have decided that we need you to do donkey duty. Who would be the first one to step up and say, I'll be happy to? We've got some donkey lovers here today. I, I, I can see that, okay? I mean, you can kind of sense this, right? These the disciples, these Jesus kind of had to explain it to them, you know? You go get a donkey. If they ask for it, you, you what you're doing, you tell them, I sent you. I mean, it was probably a little bit embarrassing, you know, to walk through the street leading a donkey. Now, I probably have a little bit of a different sense about this than you do because of my experience in Latin America, okay? When we were in Cartagena, Colombia, we lived in a, in a suburb called Crespo, all right? It was kind of a middle to upper crust uh, group of people that lived around there. And I can tell you one thing, not one of those people who lived in that neighborhood would have ever been caught ever leading a donkey around. No, sir. Across the Caño in Crespito, donde viven los pobres, yeah, see, uh, across the canal where the, where, where, where the poorer people live, uh, yeah, th those people, they're the ones that had, they had donkeys over there, but over here, we, we got a pickup truck, all right? You see, it took humility, and I don't give me wrong, I'm not talking bad about, about these people. I can tell you amazing industrious stories of, of these people. They're great people, wonderful people, but just kind of on the side of life where they didn't get a lot of opportunity in life. All right, so I'm not, I'm not doubting anybody here, but what I'm saying is that it took humility to go fetch a donkey. And I've been around a lot of people with donkeys, not just Steve, but a lot of people. And, and, and most generally, it's little kids that lead around a donkey. I'm just saying. Lessons and humility are tough. And Jesus, what he does, sometimes he makes sure that our souls are not always on center stage. Amen. He knows it's not good for the soul that, that we're always continually popular. And believe me, I have had plenty of opportunity for donkey duty in my life. Hello. And, and so what I'm saying today is that God isn't looking for celebrities. What he's looking for are servants. Come on. Do I have any servants in the house of the Lord? Do you have any people that say, you know, it doesn't really matter what's asked of me. If it's for the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, don't keep duty or not. I sign up and I'm ready. Come on, somebody. Are you ready to serve him or not? In fact, a little bit later in the week, uh, after, you know, Jesus rode in on a donkey, you'll find that Jesus showed everybody that he was willing to take on the complete form of of a servant. Let me read it to you. John chapter 13 verse 3 to 5. And I like this first verse. Because you see. Jesus knew who he was. If you know who you are. It doesn't bother, bother you. To have donkey duty. Come on somebody. Now, how many of you know the Lord's going to test the pastor. And everything he gets up and preaches. I got here this morning. And apparently somebody. Had pulled into our parking lot and right there maybe some of you drove over top of it but they decided to let go of of what they had been eating that day and right there in the parking lot with all kinds of little paper towels and all kinds and I said Lord are you kidding me you mean to tell me I got donkey duty today yes I did all right this is what Jesus did says but I know who I am right I'm a son of the living God come on I'm not the son of a living God, but I am a son of God. Come on. How many of you are with me? This is what Jesus said, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hand, and that he had come from God and was going to God. That's who Jesus knew who he was, right? I came from God. I'm going back to God. This is what he said. It says he rose from supper, laid aside his garments, took a towel, and girded himself. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel. Now let me tell you something. This was even more humbling than donkey duty. This is called 
Wash the stinky feet that stepped in donkey doo doo. How, how many of you are with me today? Come on. Uh, gee, th- this would have been done among the, the lowest servants in the house would have been the one that would have been assigned to wash people's feet. But let me tell you something. Jesus wasn't ashamed or embarrassed to do it. He did it because he wanted to leave an example. In fact, John 13, verse 13 says, he said, you call me teacher and Lord and you say uh, you say, well, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you should do as I have done for you. How many of you know that success in the kingdom is so different than success in the world? Come on. The world measures your success by how you look, how much money you got in the bank, how nice of a car you drive. But let me tell you something. In the kingdom of God, your success is going to be measured is by did you, are you willing to serve the king of kings and the Lord of lords? And I can tell you this, that those who serve well will also be recognized. Come on. Did you know that even if you gave a cup of cold water in the name of Jesus, you're going to get a reward? Amen. How much more reward will you get for donkey duty? Come on, somebody. In fact, did you know that Jesus, the highest individual in the universe, got that name that's above every name because he took on the form of a servant and served? And became obedient. That's what it says in the book of Philippians chapter 2. It says talking about Jesus who being in the form of God didn't consider robbery it robbery to be equal with God. But what did it say he did? He made himself of no reputation taking on the form of a bond sermon and coming in the likeness of men and being found in an appearance as a man. He humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death even the death on the cross. But then the scripture says this, therefore, now let me teach you something. When you're reading the Bible and you come to therefore, you ask what it's there for. What? It says, therefore, God has exalted him, right? What, 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 why did he exalt him? He exalted him because he was willing to take on the form of a servant and go to the cross. And that's why we say that at the name of Jesus, every knee is going to bow and every tongue is going to confess that Jesus Christ is the Lord to the glory of God the Father. Come on, somebody. If you are willing to serve the Lord, no matter what it is, give the Lord a big hand of praise today. Amen. And then lesson number two is that our internal identity is more important than our external image. Huh. Greatness does not come in the kingdom from the image that you present to the world. Greatness comes in the kingdom from who you are on the inside. Oh, I'm getting good today. I'm getting deep today. You see, Jesus wanted his disciples to know that it is not about how you present yourself. It's who you actually are. How many of you know you can present yourself one way and that's not really who you are? God is more concerned about who you are on the inside than the image that you promote and that you give to the world. Come on. Now what I'm trying to say is that, that, that the important thing in the kingdom is how you've ordered your inner man, not how you clothe the outer man. You see, you don't need the world's trappings to be great in God's eyes. You don't need a lot of money to be great in God's eyes. You don't have to try to image yourself in such a way that people will know and believe that you're a Christian. If you're a believer, come on, the light that's in you is going to shine out and touch those that are around you. Come on. And Jesus gave his disciples a great lesson that day. An illustrated sermon, so to speak, when he got on that donkey and rode into Jerusalem. Now, it would kind of like be, be like me trying to get on a get on a little mini bike, you know, all two hundred and forty six pounds of me. Uh, uh-uh. Honda ninety ain't gonna do it anymore. Come on, I need a Triumph twenty five hundred Rocket three. All right, but you can look that up later if you don't know what I'm talking about. Just picture a thirty three year old man. On a donkey, I mean, his feet are almost touching the ground. He's too tall. It's not elegant. But how many of you know that the people didn't seem to mind that Jesus was on a donkey? Come on, they didn't mind at all. 
They were praising. They were worshiping. They were taking their cloaks off. They were shouting, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna to the king. You want to know why? It's because they had figured out who Jesus was. They had experienced his love. They had experienced his grace. He didn't have to try to position himself to be somebody. Come on now. He was somebody. Come on. Can you give a big hand to Jesus today? Matthew chapter 21, 10 tells us this. And when he had come into Jerusalem, all the city was moved, saying, who is this? You see, they wanted to know who this guy was that even on a donkey with his feet just a quarter of an inch off the ground, how could this guy be so praised and wonderful? Was he, was he the Messiah? Would he, would he deliver us from from, from the Romans, who is this? Now, now you and I, we, we know who he is. Come on. How many of you know who he is? He's the king of kings. But Zechariah had predicted all of this. Zechariah 9 and verse 9 tells us this hundreds of years before it had been predicted. It says, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. He is just and having salvation lowly and riding on a donkey, a colt, the foal of a donkey. Uh, the king is coming on a donkey's colt? Are, are you kidding me? I mean, kings image themselves in such a way that they look strong and powerful. Am I right? I mean, what kind of a king does that? I mean, where are his armies? Where's his weaponry? Where are the flags and the standards and the symbols of power? You see, I want to tell you this. Jesus didn't need any of that to show who he was. Come on. He knew who he was. Uh, in fact, he knew that he had 12 legions of angels at his disposal at any minute. He knew that all authority and power in heaven and in earth was given unto him. Come on, somebody. I mean, if they had listened, they would have figured it out. Because this is what Jesus said. He said, before Abraham, I was. <laughs> right? He said, I and my father are one. He prayed like this. Glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had with you before the world existed. In fact, I really love the story where they came to arrest him later that week, right? May I, you know, the soldiers are there and Judas is going to betray him with the kiss. And they said, are you, are, are you the one? Are, are you Jesus? He answered just with two words in the English language. He said, I am. <laughs> kind of a little bit reminiscent of I am that I am. He said, I am. And guess what happened? The whole crew fell over backwards. Come on, how many of you know Jesus knew who he was? He did not have to, you know, position himself and image himself in such a way. He told Pilate later on that week, he said, you don't have any authority uh, except what has been given to you by my Father. I freely laid my life down. Now, I want you to hear me today because in the first century, the Jews were expecting a king. They were looking for a deliverer, a man who would liberate Jerusalem and, and the surrounding area from Roman control. And they hoped it would be Jesus, but Jesus chose a donkey. On the opposite side of the city, I'm told, from some sources from the west, they say that Pontius Pilate, the Roman governor of Idumea, Judea, and Samaria, he also entered Jerusalem. He was at the head of a column of imperial cavalry and soldiers. Jesus' procession proclaimed the kingdom of God, but Pilate's proclaimed the power of the empire of that day. Pilate's military procession was a demonstration of Roman imperial power. I mean, just imagine cavalry on, so on horses, foot soldiers, leather army, helmets, weapons, banners, golden eagles mounted on poles, sun glinting on metal and gold, and, and there were the sounds of marching feet and the, the beating of drums and the clinking of bridles and there was a swirl of dust and the people were silent as they watched this procession go by a military power. Probably most infuriating to the mind, at least to the Jewish mind, was what we call the Roman imperial theology of that day because you see, Pilate represented Caesar, uh, Tiberius Caesar to be exact, 
And history notes that they called him Son of God, Lord, and Savior. And there were inscriptions that said that he brought peace on the earth. And, and though it was probably unfamiliar to us, but let me tell you something. Every time there was a big event in Jerusalem, you see, the governor had Pontius Pilate. He had to show a show of force so nothing would happen that he was in control. I wonder what color Pilate's horse was. He rode in on that. He didn't choose a donkey. He rose on a horse. Was it a black horse? Was it a white horse? I'm not really sure. But he had all the trappings of power and prestige with him. But you see, for the disciples of Jesus. Do I got any disciples here? These two processions are an illustrated sermon, right? I mean, how would they live their lives? Not only that, but how will we choose to live ours? You see, Pilate chose a horse, but Jesus chose a donkey. Jesus was not in an ornate chariot pulled by well-bred horses. There was no sword at his side or armor on his chest. He didn't enter the city gates with the show of force. It was an enacted metaphor, I believe, to show who Jesus was and what he expected of his disciples. And yet we know that Zechariah, the same one that predicted he would ride a donkey's colt in the very next verse, he says this in Zechariah 9.10. It says, His dominion shall be from sea to sea. Come on. And so he refused power, you see. Uh, he re didn't accept an earthly throne, but rather he chose a donkey, and that donkey eventually led him to a cross. And so let me ask you a question today. Do you know who you are? Huh? I'm talking to Christians today and disciples of Jesus. Do you know who you are down on the inside? Uh, you, do you need the trappings of all the world around you in order to feel like you're somebody? Uh, or are you content to understand who you are? That if you've accepted the Lord Jesus Christ as a, your Savior, you're a son and a daughter of Almighty God. Come on. Amen. Doesn't matter whether the world recognizes you or not. Come on, that's who you are. Because when you walk into the boardroom, I'll tell you who you are. You're salt and you're light. Come on, somebody. Amen. When you walk on through the job and you've been praying, amen, you carry the anointing of the Spirit of God with you. You don't have to announce it. It's just there and it's active and it's at work. Come on. When you're at the family reunion, you're more than Uncle Joe's little nephew or niece. You're an ambassador for the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Do I have anybody who knows who they are that you don't need all the trappings of the world? All you need to know is that Christ is in you. The hope of glory. You're immersed in, baptized in, surrounded by the third person of the Trinity, the mighty Holy Spirit. And standing behind you is God the Father with all of His power and strength and might. Did you know if they strip away everything you had? Your home? Your cars? Your wealth? By the way, it happened to the Christians in Syria. They stripped it all away. You want to know something didn't change who they were? Amen. On the inside, they're still believers and servants of the Most High God. Amen. Number three, the third lesson they learned that week is that our obedience is not connected to popularity. Come on. They learned that a servant lives and dies for others. Jesus didn't need to be popular or well-liked or even loved by the crowd. The only thing that he wanted to do was the Father's will. The only one he wanted to please was the Father. John 6 and 38, this is what he said. For I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. Jesus, the Son, simply wanted to please the Father and do his will. In the Garden of Gethsemane, a couple days after he rode into Jerusalem, the people were celebrating and happy that he was there. 
He was in deep prayer and agony, in fact. There was a part of him that didn't want to go to the cross. But you know, he knew that one thing, it's not about popularity. It's not what I want. It's what the Father wants. And so ultimately, he said, not my will, but your will be done. Matthew chapter 20 and verse 28, he said this. He said, just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. Come on. He came as a servant to lay down his life. And it's incredible to me how quickly the popularity of Jesus changed in less than a week. In less than a week. Where were the crowd that cheered him in a few days later? Because now we have Jesus already being beaten about the face already wearing a crown of thorns, and he's being presented before Pilate, and the people that are in front of him, who are also his countrymen, these Jews, and they're chanting, we have no king but Caesar. Away with him, crucify him. But you see, none of that bothered Jesus in the least. Because you see, he wasn't in it for popularity. Come on. He was in it to please the Father. Come on. Do I have any people here today that say, listen, I don't serve Jesus to be popular. I don't proclaim the word of God so that I'll get a following. Come on. I, I don't have to be right or anything like that. All I have to do is please the Father that sent me and do his will. We know the story. Jesus standing there as a prisoner under arrest, crown of thorns on his head. The crowd was looking. Was it the same crowd? I don't really know. But the crowd that was there were looking at this one they had thought would be their deliverer. And they were disappointed. <laughs> He no longer appeared as the one who would save them from the Romans. And even as they hung him up on the cross, they taunted him and they mocked him, the scripture said. They called out to him and they said, if you are the son of God, then come down from the cross. Yeah. Another said, ha, he saved others himself. He could not save. Ha. Let me tell you something. It wasn't that he couldn't save himself. He could have saved himself. He could have came right down off of that cross with one word from his mouth. He could have destroyed his enemies. He could have called 12 legions of angels to come and rescue him. It was not that he could not save himself. It was that he would not save himself because he chose to be a servant and he chose to say it's not about me. It's not about what I want. I don't have to have my way. I'll do his way every single time and Jesus gave his life on Calvary. That was a powerful sermon for the disciples. Because every single one of the disciples understood that there were moments in time when they were popular. Think about Peter. I mean, the power of the Holy Ghost falls. 120 people are talking in other tongues and speaking the mighty works of God and all kinds of things are happening. He gets up and preaches and 3,000 people come to Jesus. Well, that was a popular day, wasn't it? But you know something, the day came when they told Peter, that's it, buddy. You're going to be crucified. He said, look, just do me a favor. I'm not worthy to be crucified in the same way as Jesus. Just go ahead and hang me upside down. That's okay with me. You see, he was determined to say, I am not in this thing for popularity. I'm in this thing for pleasing my Father in heaven who called me. Amen. That's who we need to be as well today. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for these simple lessons that the disciples learned. Lessons about life and stewardship. And God, your word is so real and it's so powerful to us today. Lord, today we humbly submit ourselves to you. And we tell you, Lord, that we are willing, Lord, to do donkey duty if that's what you call us to do. We're willing to do whatever it takes, Lord. We're willing to serve. But Lord, just don't let us be one of those that are on the sidelines watching. We want to be in the fray, Lord. We want to be in the arena. We want to be one of those who, who your hand is upon and your, 
your glory rests upon in the mighty name of Jesus. And Lord, let us, let us as well serve you when it's popular and serve you when it's not popular. Let us be one of those who are like a tree that's planted by the rivers of living water that brings forth its fruit in its season. Oh God, let us be strong and steadfast and sure in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. The praise team is coming today.